As Angeline said, I did my DMA with Arthur. Got that in 2005 at Stony Brook, SUNY Stony Brook. I guess they're calling it Stony Brook University these days. But I, I was thinking about this and I think, I mean, I've known Arthur for a long time, like since the early 90s, I think. I think the first time I met him was, I don't remember the date, unfortunately, but it was, would have been at the San Francisco Early Music Society's Baroque Workshop that happened at lovely Dominican College at the time, but I think it's moved up further north. Um, and I took his continual workshop in, at Eastman when he had it, and, you know, just really loved working with him. Uh, he was an incredibly supportive teacher, and I just learned so much working with him. And I especially enjoyed hearing him play French Baroque music. I thought it was just some of the best. So it's really great that he's here to play and to, uh, you know, teach us more about that. Um, I guess... That's it. So, it's Arthur Hawk. Thanks, Meg. Thank you. And thanks to Wika for inviting me to do this. Um, I know it's been billed as sort of a lecture recital, but it's, it's um, lecture recitals usually there are lots of talking and then somebody plays for 10 or 15 minutes. <clears throat> and that's sort of not the way it's going to be here. It's going to be more like a little bit of talking, some relevant things, I hope, and then mostly playing. So, because that's really what I hope you all come from to hear, for to hear this, hear this really delightful music. And so, um, I've been intrigued by the music, especially of Elizabeth Jacquet Laguerre, for a long time, uh, even before, before she became really popular. Um, it used to be in those in the days, you go back 10, 15, 20 years, everyone talked about woman composer, you know, like it was this rarity. Now, of course, it's much more. Um, normal to think it's just a composer, and that's what she was, just a composer. But what we don't realize is what the kind of things that she probably had to fight against in, in those days to become known, to become, to be able to assert herself. And I want maybe the first thing to do really is to look at this handout that you probably all, hopefully you all picked up. Um, so the top is uh, Elizabeth Claude Jacquet Laguerre. Um, this was recently, uh, we've known about this, this painting for a long time, but it was only in the last, I'd say, 15 years or so that they were able to make the determination that this was in fact her. And underneath is the official court portrait of Francois Couperin. And if you just look at them, um, they're both, it, it, there's amazing similarities. They're both incredibly confident looking and very sure of themselves. Um, and at the, at, at, uh, they're at different stages of their life. Uh, she's very young. He's, I think, older and more established. But they're both really um, at the top of their game and, and, and in their profession. Um, and if you look at what she's doing, uh, she's got a quill in her hand, her right hand. And there, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, I think, actually, in the color, you might have picked up a colored uh, brochure as well. She looks a little bit easier. She actually has some music that she's written on. Um, and. Um, she was incredibly prolific, and she always was working. I think it's one of the significant things about this painting. It doesn't show her sitting anywhere in just a normal portrait. It shows her at work, really hard at work. And she was known to be someone who just worked all the time uh, at her craft. Um, and uh, Cupra, interestingly enough, is, and I'll get to this a little bit later, but this is the one official portrait we have of him. He's sitting there, bewigged and bejeweled. You know, it's the official court, and he has his hand firmly on top of a piece of music. Uh, that piece of music is a piece that I'm going to play later on today. It's called Lazy Days Heureuse. And it comes from the second or of his music. Um, it's a piece that obviously meant a lot to him. I think that maybe you could even say maybe his favorite piece, one of his favorite pieces, why would he choose that particular piece? And why did the artist you know, make sure that you can't tell from this, but you blow it up and you can tell it's that piece. So it's a piece that really meant a lot to him. And I think it meant a lot to him because He's, in a way, dedicating a lot of the music in that world to her. And that's really the point of what I'm here for today, to talk about this connection between the two of them. Um, and this is something that, it's all, it, for the most part, it's speculation, because we don't have any documentation, of, even that they knew each other. But the, but the evidence is so, so clear, and that's what I want to sort of go over a little bit and sort of make this important case. So her background, she was born in 1665, from a very, very well-known organ uh, 
family and also organ builders and players, um, the Jacquet family, so since the beginning of the 17th century. And uh, they were established right on Ile Saint-Louis, which is right in the, this little island right in the middle of Paris, which is the big origins of Paris, really. And that family was the, orga- the from generation to generation, the organist at that church, Saint-Louis en, en Lille. And uh, that's where they were. Um, uh, and then she, from the age of five years old, she was evidently quite a prodigy. She played already for the king when she was Louis XIV, when she was five or six years old. And words that were used to describe her in the, that first decade of her life and going into her early teenage years was, she's a miracle, the prodigy. How can anybody have so much talent? She was known to be able to sight read anything and also to be able to improvise at sight anything. And this is, that, that's an account from when she was 12 years old. And Louis, Louis knew her and kept her you know, under his gaze, you know, practically her whole until he died, really. In the, in the, uh, 1715, I think it was. Um, and it was his consort at the time, Madame de Montespan, who took her under, Elizabeth, under, his wing, under her wing and made sure that she had like the finest education she could have. And so there was this important, important royal connection from practically when she was born. Um, although she kept her distance, she didn't become part of the, the Versailles crowd. She stayed in Paris, and probably because she was part of that whole Jacquet family. So at age 19, she marries a very well-known organist at the time, Marin de Laguerre. And again, just like the Jacquet family, the, de, the Laguerre family was extremely well-known uh, organist in Paris. And where they were was at the Sainte Chapelle. Sainte Chapelle is right next to Notre Dame, right on, it's the next little island over it. I think even if you're walking slowly, it's about a four minute walk from that one church to that other church. Um, so here you have this merging of these two incredible organ families right, right there. Um, and uh, Marais uh, de la Guerre, and then now we have a connection also between the Laguerre family and Couperin, is that Marin, who was about seven or eight years older than Elizabeth, um, her, his, uh, his first cousin marries Francois Couperin's father's brother. Okay. Also known as Francois Couperin, the, the elder, we should say. And so, also we have a connection there that actually Couperin is actually related to uh, Elizabeth Jacques and Laguerre as well. So you have these three families, and, and where were they organists? At the famous Saint Gervais Church, since when they first started coming to Paris. And that's in the Marais, and maybe it's, uh, t- it's a 10 to 15 minute walk, but it's all these three big, very f- were well known. Or uh, churches were within walking distance of each other. Um, it's impossible not to think that both Elizabeth Jacques and Laguerre, born in 1665, and Francois Couperin, born in 1668, were not always together in family gatherings, like all the time. It'd be hard to imagine that, that they weren't. Um, she gets married when she's 19, he's only 16 at the time. Um, and suppose everyone, from what everyone says, she was extremely happy, it was a very happy marriage. And she starts to, to write music. Um, what's happening at that same time, and this is, I think, crucial to this whole co- uh, connection. So we have a personal connection, I think, that can't be denied. But there's a really important professional connection as well. Um, in starting in sort of the middle to late 1680s, or into the 90s, there was a, a someone uh, who was related to the church. His name was, um, I get it right now, so Nicolas Mathieu. He started having musical, musical evenings in his home, which was uh, right there, Saint Andre des Arts, in the sixth town of Lisboa, and very close to the middle of the city. And what he did especially was to bring in um, publications or manuscripts of foreign music that was, had nothing to do with the court. There was really an anti foreign music feeling in the court. They wanted to keep things very French. But in fact, uh, this fellow brought in a lot, of, a lot of music that came from Italy, from Germany. Um, and one of the composers that uh, was brought in that we had, wouldn't have had any no- notion about otherwise was Corelli. And Corelli's music started to be well known. Um, and from the accounts, there was one account that said, all the young composers in Paris are just totally mad. In fact, the, the word is something like hot-blooded at the idea of Corelli's music. They were just so taken with it. Because they didn't have anything like this in France, this idea of this virtuosity, these um, uh, amazing, amazing playing that was very, very different from the kind of things that was going that were going on in France. And all these young composers now really start to write in that in that fashion. 
If you look at, well, Frost Bakuma is a great example, but what he did, his first pieces are these trio sonatas. Um, and uh, he was so worried about them. They're very Italian, and they're, they're, the sonata is about seven or eight minutes long. And they're sort of one movement pieces that change moods and tempos throughout. And they later become part of a, a, a very important, a mature work of his called Les, Nas Les Nations, which are these sonatas put together, which are very Italian, put together with a, a very French dance suite. But in these early days, when he came out with them, he was so worried that, because um, his star was starting to rise in the French court, that he would be uh, you know, ostracized or castigated even for even coming out with pieces that were not really French, that he, put, he puts them out under a pseudonym. Um, that was, I mean, I think probably everybody knew what they were, but he said that instead of Cooper, I was saying like Coperino, and he said it was some Sicilian relative of his who was in the army in Italy who actually wrote them. Um, <laughs> And, it was the history, and I've got, I think it was probably okay as long, as long as it's not really his name. And it isn't until when he comes out with Les Nations, which is like the 17, uh, 1720s, late in the 1720s, he says, I have to admit now I'm guilty of lying you know, back then. And, and, he said, and he goes and t says why he's doing it. But they're very, very Italian in the way they're written. Um, as far as uh, Jackie Laguerre is concerned, her first pieces, before she comes out with her first, or at the same time as her first group of harpsichord pieces, are again these sort of trio sonatas that are very Italian. They're not in one movement, but there's, uh, there's an amazing, the fast movements are all very Italian. Running notes, scales, incredible virtuosity. And the slow movements are more, more French, so she's mixing French and Italian elements, but they're very Italian. So again, there's this connection from way back in the 1680s, 1690s, when they were both young, to write the same type of music. You can imagine them getting together with you know, colleagues and talking about the fact that, isn't this music fantastic? Better not let the king know. You, know, you, know, you can't have, have non-French music. But there was this important professional connection that, in fact, was there. Um, OK, so um, let's see. Yeah, so another connection I think is really important um, is that there was a union um, called the Menestrandes that had existed since the Middle Ages. And anybody who was involved in the arts, any kind of music or art or dance, anything, had to sort of belong to this. And there were extremely rigid rules. And you could either make it, get advanced or not get advanced, depending on whether you fit into what their rules were. And Kuprin uh, was really against this. He really wanted to modernize things. And one of his chief allies was Marin de la Guerre. The two of them really worked hard, and they were able to they were able to sort of change things a little bit, little by little. But you might be familiar with uh, a piece that Frost um, called Les Fastes de la Grande, an ancien monastrandis, which is a big parody, and it, it's it's really very funny. I'm not I'm not going to play it. It's not part of what I'm doing, but it, it basically talks about it's like a parade of all these figures who are either. Uh, he makes fun of them by calling them that they're, they're cripples and, they look, and they're drunkards and they look like apes. And then they, and there's big chaos at the end. And so um, it's all to make fun of them. But again, there's this, so in other words, you can imagine Cooper and, and, and him, De La Guerre, getting together, of course, and plotting how they're going to try to have, change these rules. So again, there's connection even after, even after this marriage takes place. So then um, what happens is that. Unfortunately, tragedy really strikes to her, and that's um, uh, she. Had, they had one son, uh, and uh, when he was ten years, we don't even know his name. But when he was, and he was supposed to be very much like her, a prodigy, incredibly gifted as a musician. He dies uh, when he's about ten years old of some sort of a childhood ailment, uh, and she's devastated. Um, and then, right after that, one after the other, a few years later, her father dies, who she was very close to. And then after that, as you start to get into the 18th, into the 18th century, uh, right away, her older brother, who was considerably older, but was like a father figure, again, she was very close to, he dies. And finally, the, the final step was that her husband dies in 1704. And so all the important people in her life die within about a seven or eight year span. Um, and she becomes reclusive, really. And there's a period in the 1690s into the early 17th century, 18th century, when she doesn't write anything. And we have an account by a close friend of hers who was, uh, her name was Lambert, and she's I think, the wife of the composer and theorist uh, Lambert, uh, who says, uh, it's a letter that she writes to her that we had. It says, um, you are great, you are a wonderful composer, you're so talented as a harpsichordist. 
You don't need to spend time with people you don't like. That's exactly what you should. The people who don't please you. Um, um, it's okay to be alone. Um, um, the, your talent will keep you from being bored. And so, a very interesting. Um, so that could mean a number of things. It could mean all these people who are, who've been part of you know what you've had to you've had to, you've had to um, support because they're, they're going to support you. you. You don't have to play that game anymore. Just write music. You know? uh, it also can mean that maybe there are certain people she didn't like. Maybe it's even Cooper. Who knows? But you know, don't worry about them. Just do what you're doing. And what follows after that from about the 1705, 1706, till the end of her life, is an unbelievable amount of work that she, uh, music that she composed. Her second book of harpsichord pieces, which I will be playing, one of the suites from, um, violin sonatas, trio sonatas, a whole series of really wonderful sacred cantatas on, uh, on Old Testament text, secular cantatas, a big motet. Um, earlier on, she did write an opera. She's, by the way, the only woman composer who, was, who had an opera who was, uh, was played at Versailles. Um, well, something else just to talk, again talk about how, uh, how assertive she was and how sure of herself and how great she was. She gets, you know, she gets married, she, uh, although she takes her husband's name at the end. She doesn't, never, never leaves her original name of Jacquet. And when she writes both of her, when all of the music comes out that gets published, um, she signs it Elizabeth Jacquet to the dedication to the king. She doesn't put Laguerre in there at all. So she is who she was with her name. Um, so uh, again, it must be an amazingly strong figure, and very sure of herself. And I think the music really shows that. The music that I'm about to play, uh, I think, shows somebody who um, is really not afraid of her emotions. Uh, I'm going to start with an unmeasured prelude, um, which is not part of the 1707 suite. It comes from her first book of pieces that came out back in, in, in eight, uh, 1686, um, and it's maybe it's the first piece in that book, so maybe it's the first piece she ever wrote. And right away, she, she throws you into the drama of what's going on. It's, it's a very hot blood piece, you'll see. Um, and um, let's see, I think, I, I didn't realize there was going to be an intermission. So because there's an intermission, I'll talk about sort of connections between her music and his music a little bit more after, after the intermission. But um, I think, uh, but as I play these various dances, sort of try to keep, in your, keep them in your mind so that when you hear what Kubran's, is the suite that I'm going to play for his, what kind of connection there is. Um, just a little bit about her music, um, the dances that I'm going to play. A lot of her dances in that suite have what they call double, doubles or variations. And um, again, I think this is, they're very Italian. I mean, what they are, they're sort of virtuoso, um, additions to the original versions of whatever piece it is, the Alman Courant. Um, and uh, so again, it's her way of, think, of having something that's French and have something that's Italian. Um, the French part of what she does is, um, including Cooper, I don't think there's anybody who writes as many ornaments as she does. She writes them all over the place, and French symbolic ornaments. And she puts them in different places than some of the other, if you think about it, you all, all know the music of Cooper or Rameau or people like that. Um, she puts them in places that are, I don't want to say awkward, but they're on offbeats. They're in places that you wouldn't expect to find on the girls all over the place. And sometimes she actually puts them together in an ornament with an Italian ornament at the same time. Um, but it's, it's music. She was very innovative that way, I think, full of, full of ideas. Um, and uh, so showing both this French and Italian uh, elements. Uh, and the last piece, I just want to talk just a bit about that, and I'll, I'll stop talking and play, is this Chacun, which is the, to end her suite. And to me, that's her greatest masterpiece. And I think a lot of people think that it's an absolutely astonishing piece. Um, she's written a lot of Chacuns that are in her first book, the more traditional. This one is Rondo Chacun, which means that there's an A section that keeps coming back. But every time it comes back, it isn't just a da capo, it isn't just always coming back. She, she makes subtle changes to it each time. So every time it gets enhanced, either adding ornaments or actually changing note values. So 16th notes become triplets, for example. And then the, the, what they call the couplets, the, the, what happens in between the rondos, also changes the mood every single time. Um, at first it starts out very French, I think, as you do a lot of dotted notes, almost like a French overture. And by the time you get to the end, the last one, it's very virtuoso. And it really sounds very Italian, Italian figuration. And then finally she returns to the original rondo. 
And again, this piece is really important. I think that's, if, any, if there's any piece that shows a connection between her and Kupran music, it is in fact that piece. And I'll talk about that in the second half. So this is the uh, first uh, suite, most of the pieces from her 1707 collection.
coins or, uh, that are on, on any of them, on musicians. And one of these four, and the only one in the entire book, is Jacques Laguerre. And this is a reproduction of, the, of both sides of that coin. And again, if you look at it, the top one is in, it's, she's now older than in that other, that other portrait. Um, but again, you see somebody who's very assertive and looking very sure of herself. Um, um, and the other side is something really interesting. It shows her sitting at the keyboard. So it shows two things that she does. There she's playing the harpsichord, and she's looking over her shoulder at an amazingly chaotic but huge bunch of scores on the floor. Right? That's her music. You know? So she's you know, in, the, like in the middle of this very productive life, and it shows both things that she does. She's both a composer and a musician. And the, what it says there, au grand musicien, j'ai disputé le prix. Um, whether this is an exact quote of something she said, I don't know. What that means is, among the great musicians, I am vying for the prize. I, do, I deserve to be there with, with them. So, and it says, I. So it's maybe it's her who said that. So there she is, you know, in all of her, in all of her glory, I think. Um, uh, there's not all that much written about her, but uh, in any of you who read French, there's one really wonderful biography of her. Uh, really, really very good. Uh, by, you can look at it afterwards. Catherine said it's in French. It's not been translated that I know of. But it goes through her whole life, and sort of every piece she wrote, and what it's like, or the connections she had. Um, doesn't say anything about what I'm talking about, because this is, it's, again, it's speculative, I think. Um, so I wanted to talk now about uh, uh, this connection between these two composers, which I think is really a very strong connection. You know, there were homage pieces written throughout the world uh, by all sorts of composers about different things, about La Forfile, La Coupera. In France, there were many things like this. There was no piece called Le Jacquet or Le Talaguerre. Nobody honored her that way. But I think Coupera honored her by the whole second ord that he writes. Um, I want to go through as to why I think that and then go through some of the pieces that way. Um, uh, so number one, if you look at the first piece uh, in, in her that I played the Allemagne called La Flamande, what does that mean? It really means Flemish, or the Flemish person. Um, and one of the theories is that it, uh, the, the dance, although it's Allemagne, should be German, is maybe this particular type of uh, Allemagne came from you know, the Flemish, you know, Flanders. I don't think that's necessarily it. I never heard of any Allemands coming from Flanders, really. But, but there was a, a theory back then, I mean, it was back then as it is now, really, that in the north, um, the, the, it, was, it was a much poorer region. And there were people who, were, um, who came down from what is now called Belgium. And they, were, they, were, they, worked, in, you know, they worked in factories. They worked in uh, domestic service. And so this could be about that. And, um, Couperin's first piece, the Allemande, is called La Laborieuse. And that actually does mean what, what it sounds like in English, too. Um, somebody who is working really hard at very detailed and very complicated um, they put it, uh, detailed work. Like, um, uh, there's a portrait I just happened to see in Paris about a year ago of someone with the, the title of that painting is called La Laborieuse. And it's somebody doing needlepoint, you know, very, very, you know, very intently with her daughter looking on. And, or think about what the craft of composition is. You know? So also the style of those pieces, usually Francois Couperin's Allemands are very grandiose and very noble. Dotted notes, huge, and they're um, you know, elegy pieces. This one is not like that. This is a lot, of, a lot of running 16th notes, just like hers. So there's a connection that I think is there because of that. Um, his uh, piece that starts, uh, uh, her courant, which had that figure that you might remember, we'll hear this soon. Is. Her courant starts with this. And that figure goes out throughout that piece that you might remember. Um, that's the same theme in La Laborieuse as you'll hear. It starts off with that exact same quote. So maybe I'm um, fishing a little bit, but I think there's a, that's there. Okay. Um, all of the dances then follow. There's Courant, Saraban, Saraban, again, very similar, French and Italian styles. Um, and then you get to um, the second piece that I, the, the gig that I played 
was, um, is a very odd type of a jig. It's called a jig lure. It's not this fast, boisterous jig they're used to. It's a jig that you don't find at all in harpsichord music, except for, the, except for Jacquet's one. And Kubrin doesn't write any jig in his second order, but he writes a piece called, uh, called La Charolaise, which is a character piece, but it's exactly the same, exactly the same kind of piece. And it comes in the same spot right after the ceremony. Um, the Rigodons, um, Kubrin only writes one set, the only Rigodons he writes for keyboard, the only ones, are the ones I'm going to play for you later in the second word. And um, again, it, it's a two-voiced piece with lots of ornaments, uh, not like the Brigodons he writes in chamber music, but exactly the same style as hers, which you remember, again, two-voiced, lots of ornaments, very sort of, sort of um, gutsy. Um, um, and then after that um, came the Chacon, which was, again, I think, her masterpiece. And what comes after that in the Cooper Amor is a piece called La Terpsichore, or Terpsichore, one of the muses, the muse of the arts. Um, and there was, and when she published her first set of piece, harpsichord pieces back in 1686, there was a poem that went along with it that somebody wrote and uh, had a, 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 before the piece start. And it's called La Terpsichore. And what it says is, um, I hear, I see Terpsichore, or Terpsichore, at the harpsichord. Um, either, either, um, it should be Jacques Laguerre, who is this muse, or we, we're mistaken and we should have a tenth muse um, devoted to her. So it's somebody who made a lot of her. Um, and so what came out of that was that that became her nickname, is that she was then known as La Terpsichore because of this. Uh, um, and so here's this piece. And again, it's very much like this shotgun. This comes right exactly in the middle of this order of Coupera. It's like the centerpiece. It's a big, bold piece with the same kind of dotted notes. I think it's, um, it, it's, if there's any real visceral connection between the two of the, these compositions, it's in fact that piece. You'll, you'll hear some direct quotes, but you'll hear definitely the style. It's very noble and very godlike, really, because Tuvita Terpsichore was, a, you know, was, was one of the muses. So that's there. And after that come a whole bunch of um, character pieces. Um, the dances are really sort of finished, and each one of them, I think, has a connection. So, the one that comes right after that is called Lazy Days of Rose. Um, I made a little mention of that before. Um, this is a piece I think that was near and dear to Cooper because again, there's his hand on that piece. He really thought it was an important piece. I'll let you decide what you think of the piece if you don't already know it. It's one of his most gorgeous compositions. And what it means, it, it can't really be translated as happy ideas. It's not that. It really refers to happier times, or times when either things that were really, you remembering back to uh, really wonderful times, or times that might someday be. It's, it's thinking about hearkening back to really an important happiness or, or period. Um, what's noticeable in the piece is that there are all these things that sound cadential, but they don't resolve. It's like he goes there and then he comes back. It happens over and over again, it's in the second half. And I think it's like, to me, maybe, maybe I'm projecting, but it's like she is, or he is um, wanting something that he can't get. It takes, it takes you all the way to the end of the piece before you really hear a resolution, before it just goes there and then comes back, it comes back all the time, um, full of chromaticism. You know. um, after that, la diligence, <coughs> I mean, same word, diligent. Um, a hard worker, somebody who works all the time. And what you'll notice in that piece is sometimes the same figure repeated over and over again. It's like trying to get something right. If, any, if, if she was anything, it was a hard worker. She went all, all the time. There she is with, her, with the quill in her hand. So I think that refers to her. La flatteuse, again, really interesting. What that means is a flatterer, somebody who flatters somebody. Flattery in the 18th century and 17th century was ex an extremely pejorative term. If, you, if somebody was a flatterer, it was, you didn't, it, was a, it was a terrible thing to call somebody. It meant somebody who was obsequious, somebody who was wheedling, trying to get, get somewhere. Um, and, um, but he presents this in, in a way that also he calls it to be played with much affection, and with a lot of affect. And it is a very sympathetic piece. And I, th I think what he's doing, he's, talking, he's thinking about himself, he'll, like he'll do anything to try to either become a friend of hers again, or maybe something more than that. But um, he, um, he doesn't like calling himself a flatterer, but I think he is. And the piece itself, is in the form of a lure, which is a dance that is, is like a slow G. The, the rhythmic pattern is bum bum, 
Bah, 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 bah. And lures, there aren't that many lures if you, in French music. There's usually one in every opera. And a lot of times, um, it's a grotesque piece. It's a piece that uh, exotic people are dancing or, or monsters are dancing. It's, it's, it, it wasn't like one of the fashionable court dancers. So, I mean, grotesque in the sense of being exotic, um, not our sense of the word grotesque. Um, and I think he's painting a picture of himself here, you know, but sympathetic, but, you know, and that, that's followed by La Voluptuas, and I don't think I need to translate that, uh, nor do I need to say who it's referring to. It's not a mystery as to why it comes right after La Voluptuas. And it's a, it's a piece, you now if you think about, before you even hear this piece, what a piece like, with a name like that would sound like, you might be surprised. It's a very, um, it's, an, it's a piece that is very, it's, it has a lot of affect, it's emotional, but it's, it's much drier than the piece before. It's like, has a lot more restraint to it. And I think this is, would be like his response. Yeah, okay, fine, but, you know, I'm not going to go any further than maybe what it is. Um, and then he ends with a piece called Les Papillons. Um, and uh, Papillon in French now means butterfly, or even bow tie. Back then, uh, there are a number of different meanings for it, and one of them is that um, they you know, had all these wonderful court balls, and if you think about these glittering rooms where they had these balls, filled with candlelight, right? And women wore these diamond barrettes in their hair, and as they danced and whirled around, these, there'd be these flashes of light that came out of that. And that was, that was called papillon. These were these, these papillon, just brilliant flashes of light. And you're certainly going to hear that in there. But there's another 18th century, 17th century meaning of that word. Um, and it's, it's a whole phrase called faire le papillon, to do the papillon. What it means really is to play a practical joke on somebody. It also means making a sucker out of somebody. Oh, la faire le papillon. It means that somebody did some maybe harsh or cruel joke on you. I think this is Cooper is saying, okay, I've done everything I can. Uh, I can't do it anymore. So it's a way of just hold, coming, coming away from the emotional part and trying to, to get away from it, I, I can't do it anymore. And he, you know, we know so much about her, his, her life that she was very happy until all these tragedies happened and she was so prolific. We know very little, we know hardly anything about him. He's this famous person, not one letter, no, nothing personal at all about him. We know he got married, we know the name of his wife, but that, the only thing we know about her is her name, period. There, there was absolutely nothing from before she married or afterwards about, about we don't know what his marriage was like, his personal life was like. We know that the last 10 years of his life was so, he was beset by, he was a hypochondriac. He's always complaining about being in ill health and, uh, and moping around and uh, getting away, trying to get away from society. But he, you don't get a picture of a happy, of a happy. you get a picture of him who's maybe not quite so, so happy. The homage piece that I know so well, I'm not gonna play it today, because not part of this, uh, is a piece that Forqueray wrote called La Coupera. And it's a piece that's very, very noble. It's a great piece, but it's also a very profoundly, I think, sad piece with the dissonances. Um, it's not at all, it's not like an elegy, really. It's more like this is his character, somebody who was, who was not ever really in a good mood. I don't know. But it's unbelievably profound, great music. And I think that what he's doing in this, in this second or, I mean, again, the place of it, the first ord is dedicated to the king, as it had to be. The second one, I think, really is dedicated to her. And I'm going to start off with the, the prelude in the same key that comes out of his method on how to play the harpsichord.
long-time relationship, it must have occurred to them to play, if not write, some duets. <laughs> I'm sure they probably didn't play duets. It wouldn't surprise me that they would have. But they didn't write duets. Well, there are, there are a number of pieces that he wrote that are, in fact, two harpsichord pieces. They can only, you know, they can only, there's the gorgeous Alman, there are those musettes that he wrote, and other, about five or six pieces. But no indication that they played them together. No. In fact, we have no, no instance of them ever even meeting. There's not, not, not even something we said, well, Cooper Brown was here and John K. Lego was there. We, nobody ever mentions it. But it's impossible that it didn't happen. There are, too many, there are too many connections there. <coughs> yeah, but as far as duets, I can't imagine they, they probably would have gotten together. And there were these musical evenings all the time. I mean, what happened in the Bach family didn't just happen in the Bach family. People were getting together and just playing all the time. Yeah. Too bad we don't have any duets. Yeah? Did Elizabeth Jaffe write for the organ at all? Um, I don't think she did, actually. I think she may have left that to her husband. Okay. <laughs> yeah. didn't, want, didn't want to get, into, get in his way. Yeah, not yeah. yeah. But no, we don't know any organ works. Okay. In fact, I, I guess, uh, in fact, the sacred cantatas, I, I think they sound better if they're accompanied on harpsichord, actually, not on, because they, they sound like secular cantatas just happen to have a sacred text. Mm -hmm. But no, there are no organ pieces that I know of. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought of that before. No. You think she ever subbed for him and he couldn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possible. Yeah. yeah, these things were handed down generation by, you know, when Cooper and I got his job at Saint Gervais, his father died when he was 11, and he was given the, the post already at age 11. But then I think it was Dalan or something was, said he'll do it until Cooper and becomes of age, but it was Cooper and position. It, was, it stayed in the family. We'll enjoy all the rest of the harpsichords. Thank you for coming. Thank you.